Hi everyone, welcome back to another video, and we're talking about something I never thought I would have to make a video about, but we are talking about ivermectin today, because a lot of people have decided that they were going to go out and treat their COVID or uh, do prophylaxis for COVID with horse dewormer paste. And uh, I guess they're using the horse kind because it's readily available, easily accessible, you don't need a prescription for it from a doctor in order to buy it, whereas the human form of ivermectin, because yes, we do give this to humans, um, has to be prescribed by a doctor, and no doctor worth their salt is going to prescribe you ivermectin for anything it is not indicated for. Um, and, and one of the reasons why I'm making this video is because somebody told me that you don't need to understand the mechanism of a drug in order to benefit from it, and that is true. You do not need to understand the, the mechanism in order to benefit from uh, advances in medicine. However, if you are going to prescribe medication, you do need to understand how it works. Uh, if you are going to educate the public on what medications to take or how to take their meds, you need to know how it works. If you are telling somebody else to take a medication, you should know how it works. Um, so I do know how this works. I know how Iver ivermectin works. I've been tested on this. It is on the medical boards. Um, and there is no evidence that says that any mechanism of ivermectin could work for COVID. And I hope that this information will help you understand why and also understand kind of the risks involved with taking horse ivermectin. Um, but why would we use ivermectin for humans? Uh, because we do. Like I said, we make a human dosage of ivermectin. So why would we use this? Why do we have this? This is for parasitic infections. Um, so on-label uses include uh, onchocerciasis and strongyloidiasis. Both are worm infections. Uh, strongyloides is a roundworm that can uh, infect your body and cause a lot of problems. Um, Off-label uses are for things like scabies, lice, uh, ascariasis, uh, Wucheria bancrofti, uh, because these are also parasitic infections. You can see this is kind of a trend that we're going along with this. You can use a topical ivermectin for rosacea, which is a skin condition, uh, but today we're just going to talk about oral ivermectin or systemic ivermectin, uh, because this is, I believe, what the horse ivermectin is. I believe that people are talking about oral uses, so we're not going to cover topical, but that is another option, but that's dose and administered differently um, than this one. So we have these uses. So how exactly does ivermectin do this? And the mechanism is by uh, binding to glutamate-mediated chloride channels. And uh, this is something that is special to invertebrates. So something important to mention is that we don't have these glutamate-mediated chloride channels. Uh, and why is this important? Well, if we're going to use a drug to treat a human illness, especially if we're going to treat a parasite. We want to kill the parasite, but we don't want to kill the host. So we picked a receptor that we don't have so that it's going to target the parasite and not us. Uh, but how does this work? So um, in these parasites, they have nerves, they have muscles, and they all have action potentials. And in order to fire an action potential, you need to depolarize the cell, and this means you need to make it more positive. And how we make this more positive is we have an influx of sodium through sodium channels. Once we add sodium, we get depolarization and action potential can fire. Um, but the way we can prevent this from happening or we can regulate the uh, action potential is through chloride because chloride is negative. We're gonna add more negative potential. It is going to hyperpolarize. So it's gonna be farther away from depolarization, making it harder for action potentials to fire. And this is going to lead to paralysis and death of the parasites. Uh, it can also uh, cause some increased permeability, they believe, um, but either way, it's going to cause the worm not to be able to survive. And then you can just pass the worm in your feces and it'll be all done. Uh, so that is the mechanism of action for ivermectin. As you can see, this is very dependent on a nervous system and on muscles. And viruses don't have these. I don't believe that COVID has chloride channels. Um, so I don't think that this would really be effective. Uh, of course, there needs to be studies. And I believe the, the CDC is working on conducting studies uh, on this. But 
for for right now, there is no data that says that any mechanism would impact COVID, so it's just kind of useless. Uh, but where we get problems uh, is with dosing, because of course, horses are a lot bigger than humans are, so if you're taking a tube of horse paste, it's meant for a horse's body and a horse's weight. Humans are not horses. Um, we do take similar doses uh, per kilogram of body weight. Um, so for onchocerciasis, uh, the dosage is 150 micrograms per kilogram, and that's taken every 3 to 12 months until symptoms resolve. And then with strongyloidosis, um, you're going to have uh, 200 micrograms per kilogram, and that's you're going to take every day for one to two days uh, until you pass the worms and they're no longer present. And if you look at the box of the horse dewormer, you're, you'll notice that the dosage looks to be the same because for a horse, it's also 200 micrograms per kilogram. And this is kind of the same dosage you'd use for all these off-label uses as well. 200 is kind of the magic number here. Um, but you, you see the same number. So I could see why someone would say, okay, we use 200 micrograms for a horse. We use 200 micrograms for a human. So it's the same. It is not the same because remember, 200 micrograms per kilogram of body weight. So you have to multiply this 200 by their body weight in kilograms in order to get the actual dosage that you are receiving. So let's do some math here. We have a 75 kilogram human. Um, and so we multiply 75 times 200 micrograms. We get 15,000 micrograms or 15 milligrams if you convert that out. Okay, so this is kind of our magic dosage, like our, our average dosage we're gonna get for a, for a human. But if we have a horse, uh, so we have in these uh, horse tubes, it says that, at least the one that I looked at, it said that it could treat up to 1,250 pounds of horse, uh, which calculates out to 568 kilograms of a horse. And so if you take 568 kilos times 200 micrograms, you get 113,636 micrograms or 113.6 milligrams. And so comparing these numbers, you get roughly 7.5 times the dose that you would take as a human. So one tube is 7.5 doses for what a human should be taking. This is insanity. You should not be taking that much ivermectin. That is a really high amount, and we're going to talk about adverse effects of ivermectin and kind of explain what can happen to you if, if you take these high doses of this medication. So some adverse effects, and I'm not listing all of them. There are a lot of them. I'm just going to cover some major ones. Uh, but if you look at uh, adverse effects for ivermectin, you'll see some of them that I'm not going to include because they go along with a reaction that you get when you kill off parasites. Because think about this, when you're, you're making a drug label for this, you're considering a parasitic infection. And there are sensitivity reactions that you get when a parasite dies in your body. You have a reaction to uh, compounds released by this dead parasite. And so that is part of a lot of the adverse effects that you get from ivermectin, but I'm not going to include them because those are not relevant for if you're using this, uh, if you don't have a, a parasitic infection. But some of the more common uh, side effects you might get are things like tachycardia. So your heart rate might be fast. You might have a hypersensitivity reaction. Uh, so like an allergy, you might have some peripheral edema. So you might have some swelling in your ankles, in your arms, and that's kind of bad. Um, a lot of eye problems, a lot of uveitis, a lot of chorioretinitis, things that might happen uh, from ivermectin to your eyes. Uh, you might have some orthostatic hypotension, which is when uh, if you if you ever has stand stood up too quickly and you kind of feel lightheaded um, because of your low blood pressure, that's what's happening here. So when if you go from a sitting position to a standing position, you might have low blood pressure, you might get dizzy, uh, because your blood isn't moving effectively to the rest of your body. So that is orthostatic hypotension. You might get that. You also might get something called leukopenia, which is a low white blood cell count. And this can be problematic for dealing with infections. 
so some things that are more common uh, that you could get from ivermectin, uh, and granted, the higher of a dose you take, the greater likelihood of getting these kinds of things you would have. Uh, but what are some more of the serious side effects of ivermectin? So things that we need to watch out for is CNS toxicity. So central nervous system toxicity, because uh, the mechanism of action with this drug is messing with chloride channels. And granted, we don't have these specific uh, glutamate channels, um, but you might have similar binding with other glutamate related things uh, in your body. So CNS toxicity is a big deal. Um, Stevens Johnson syndrome is a very, 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 very severe allergic reaction that people can get to drugs. It involves a rash and it, it can keep in the hospital. It's very dangerous to have Stevens Johnson syndrome. Uh, and then one that I starred is hepatitis. And this is due to its metabolism because ivermectin is metabolized in the liver. So if you're consuming high amounts of ivermectin, you can cause a lot of liver damage. And uh, before I go into that specifically, I do want to talk about some major contraindications for ivermectin. Please do not ever, do not ever give ivermectin to a child under the age of two. And this is because of risk of encephalopathy. And this is uh, a problem with your brain and brain swelling. So uh, ivermectin does not readily cross the blood brain barrier and adults have a really good blood brain barrier. Uh, you're going to keep this drug out of your brain if you're an adult, but children have a, a not super well developed blood brain barrier. So they're going to have the drug more easily cross into their brain. And so you can get these complications in children. So also do not take this if you're breastfeeding or if you're pregnant, because if you're breastfeeding, you can actually pass on the ivermectin through your breast milk to your, your baby, and you can give your baby encephalopathy. So please don't do this. Don't give this to your children. Don't do this if you're breastfeeding or pregnant. If you have any way of passing this drug on to your child, don't do it. It's so dangerous. Just don't do it. Uh, but going into the hepatitis thing. So why do we get hepatitis from uh, high amounts of ivermectin? So a lot of drugs and ivermectin included are metabolized by a family of enzymes called cytochrome P450. And um, there are multiple enzymes that fit into this family of cytochrome P450. Um, and since you're metabolizing a lot of drugs by this mechanism, um, it's very easy for your cytochromes to get overwhelmed. Uh, you only have so many enzymes and if you're metabolizing a lot of drugs through these cytochromes, um, you can't metabolize it all as one, at once. You can only do a certain amount at a time. So what happens to the rest of it? It backs up and it stays in your body for a longer amount of time. And it's more able to cause damage because you're not able to clear it from your system. So it just kind of builds up. And if you have multiple drugs competing for these same enzymes, uh, you can cause it to back up further and you're going to get more buildup in your body. It's not going to be readily cleared. And again, like with this, if you take a smaller amount of ivermectin, so if you take a normal dose recommended uh, by a doctor, that's less that can block up your cytochromes. So you're going to be able to clear that small amount because you're not inhibiting all of these enzymes. You have enough enzyme to metabolize your drug, you're going to be able to excrete it. But if you have a high amount, like a horse level of ivermectin, your cytochromes cannot catch up. It's going to build up. You're going to have increased toxicity. And especially if this is hanging out in your liver, you're overwhelming your liver, you can get hepatitis. So this is why we would get that. Uh, but I do want to talk about um, these specific cytochromes because this leads into our next topic of drug interactions. Uh, because a lot of people in America and all over the world take medications on a daily basis. You take drugs uh, for your other health issues. And these are often metabolized 
by these enzymes. So the specific ones uh, that metabolize ivermectin are CYP3A4. This is the major one. And then you also have some metabolism by CYP2D6 and CYP2E1. CYP2E1 is specifically also involved in uh, alcohol metabolism if you are a chronic alcohol user. And we won't go into all that. I'm mostly going to focus right now on CYP3A4 because I don't want to overwhelm you all with drug interactions. But just know that these drugs compete for cytochrome P450. And some of these drugs actually inhibit cytochromes. So not only are you backing up these cytochromes, but some of these drugs will inhibit. They will stop the amount of drug you, uh, amount of enzymes you already have, giving you a decreased amount of enzyme. So then you can metabolize even fewer molecules of ivermectin. And some of these drugs are medications that a lot of people take. So specifically CYP3A4 inhibitors include grapefruit juice. And this is why um, your doctor or your pharmacist may tell you to not drink grapefruit juice or to not eat grapefruit when taking certain drugs. And this is because it inhibits CYP3A4. Antidepressants, a very commonly prescribed drug class, uh, namely fluoxetine uh, is a drug that can inhibit CYP3A4. Calcium channel blockers. If you have arrhythmias or any heart disease and you're taking verapamil or diltiazem, those are CYP3A4 inhibitors. So that can have interactions and cause you to have higher toxicity of ivermectin. Um, Anti-HIV drugs like ritonavir. Ritonavir can inhibit CYP3A4. And macrolide antibiotics uh, like clarithromycin that can inhibit CYP3A4, and that's often used for pneumonias, um, namely like atypical pneumonias. So if you're taking a macrolide antibiotic, that can inhibit CYP3A4. And there are other drugs I am not even going to include, the inhibitors of CYP2D6 or CYP2E1. Also, there are drugs that can uh, induce CYP, uh, the cytochrome P450, and I'm not going to go into that. But this was just meant to tell you how complicated of a system this is, how much ivermectin can mess with your liver, can mess with other drugs that you're on. And, and keep in mind too, you're not only keeping ivermectin in your body longer by inhibiting uh, the cytochrome P450 system, you are also prolonging effects of your other drugs. So your antidepressants cannot be excreted as well. Your calcium channel blockers would not be able to be excreted as well. Those are going to have higher toxicities as well. So you're, you're going to have ivermectin toxicity with your giant horse dose of dewormer paste, but you're also going to increase your likelihood of arrhythmia from a calcium channel blocker. So this is very complicated and should not be something that you mess with on your own. If you need to take ivermectin or you need to mess with your cytochromes, this is something your doctor should be doing. You should not be handling this on your own because it is incredibly dangerous. And of course, addressing the elephant in the room one more time, should you use this for COVID? No, absolutely not, especially not for prophylaxis of COVID. I know people are looking for an easy answer. We have one. We have one of those. It is a vaccine. We have an mRNA vaccine that has been demonstrated to be effective. It has been demonstrated to be safe and you can get it for free. I don't see why people are wanting to take ivermectin and especially giant horse doses of ivermectin risking um, drug interactions, risking complications, risking children getting encephalopathy, risking a lot of these things because they don't want the vaccine. Why is this better? I don't get how they think this is better. So don't do it. Don't take ivermectin for COVID. Only take ivermectin if it has been prescribed to you by your doctor. That is the only acceptable time you should take it. Do not self-medicate. And that is where I'm going to leave it at. Please leave your questions down below. Leave your debates down below. I feel like I'm going to get a lot of them. But don't do it. Just, just don't. <laughs>